Hi there, you're watching the World Healthcare Congress Interview Zone, and we're so pleased to have with me John Castiani, who is President and CEO of Pharma. That's the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. John, thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Delighted to be here. Well, at this particular meeting, you're here to talk about beta, uh, information right. sharing, mm -hmm. big data. How does this uh, particular issue affect your sector that you represent? Well, it has great promise, and most importantly, it has great promise for patients. You know, in the past, say for the last century or so, the discovery process for biopharmaceuticals has been very much an in-house closed source system mm -hmm. where great scientists go to work in their own laboratories mm -hmm. and discover great uh, medicines and, and many of them have, have done wonders for patients and life expectancy and the quality of life. But that science is changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. It's going from a closed source system to an open source system so that we know with the new medicines that are being developed now, the medicines that are tied to the human genome, the medicines that are complex therapies for some of the biggest health challenges that we face, in order to discover them, in order to develop them, and in order to do it in a much more timely basis because the patients need them, we're going to have to have an open source system where we responsibly share data with between and among our own scientists in the biopharmaceutical industry, <clears throat> with government researchers, with academic researchers, with physicians and with patient groups. That's where the science of the future is coming from. Okay, how does this, um, is there uh, at risk the protection of private innovators? Well, you, you, this actually reinforces the private innovators because, uh, for example, we at Pharma, together with our counterparts in Europe last year, made a commitment that we would share all of our clinical trial data with any legitimate researcher, mm -hmm. provided they met the condition that they were indeed a legitimate researcher, and that they would share, they would protect both commercially confidential information, so you can continue to attract the very expensive uh, investment, investment in this very expensive process, mm -hmm. and of course, that they would absolutely protect the patient-specific data. Okay. So we think that that system will continue to bring the, the, the kind of investment that is necessary in our very difficult, very time-consuming, and quite frankly, very expensive process. And what was the response of the private sector it's, to this? The private sector, we are the private sector. I mean, mm -hmm. we do, um, and I, uh, uh, the, the uh, National Science Foundation tells us that we do 20% of all of the privately funded research and development by industry in the United States. And our shareholders, our investments, our investors, the private equity portion of the um, ecosystem in which we deal, think that those protections will be sufficient so that they'll continue to be able to get a fair return for the investment they make in, in medicine development as mm -hmm. opposed to cosmetics or soft drinks or mm -hmm. uh, software or any, anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, so we think the protections are, are sufficient. Uh, what are some of the innovative um, projects that are going on right now that you're excited about? Yeah, let, me, uh, let me just uh, mention three that are underway now. One is uh, one that is in the cancer space, mm -hmm. um, and that's called uh, the, uh, the, the biosphere, the cancer sphere, data sphere project that comes out of the CEO Cancer Roundtable where there are eight, nine companies that are involved in cancer research. There are three medical institutions, two universities, and a software company uh, where we have all agreed to share our clinical trial data uh, on oncology studies. Um, it's done on a pre-competitive basis so that each company will go down a pathway for each different kind of therapy that they think is the most promising know knowing what they know but we're sharing the data that is common to all of those pathways in advance, and that's been very successful. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there's one that is being done among about eight companies and the NIH on the very difficult mm -hmm. problem of Alzheimer's. Now, Alzheimer's, it, it is a devastating disease. It's, it's the thief in the night. You, know, you, you, you didn't do anything to get it, and we don't yet know what causes it. Mm -hmm. So we don't yet have a target. Mm -hmm. um, and it may be one of those unique instances in science and in medicine where the cure will define the cause mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than the traditional other way around. So they are sharing data. They are sharing data with the NIH scientists to better understand what the potential causes may be of this disease so we can attack the target once you identify it. And then just two weeks ago, again, 11 of our companies, uh, ourselves as pharma, uh, the NIH, 
uh, started the Advanced Medicines Program, Advanced Medicines Project, where we're looking at sharing data on diabetes, on lupus, um, and on HIV AIDS to, to again, continue to advance the, the science. So there, that's just three. There are others that are out there, but that's the nature of the science going forward. It sounds so important. It sounds like it makes so much sense to be sharing sure. this information mm -hmm. to quicken the process of getting to some solutions. You have your annual meeting next week, I understand. This week, yeah. This week, yeah. okay. So what are some of the things that are on your members' minds? Well, one of the things is how do we advance the regulatory science at the same speed we're advancing the discovery science because you know our regulatory process is, is critical to for patients and the public to be absolutely assured that medicines are safe and effective yet the science of discovery is changing very rapidly and today for example we're talking about big data and yes. we'll be talking about big data uh, at our meeting so now if you have data that is coming from patients everywhere across America how does that relate to a 40 year old system of double-blind, placebo-based studies, when you and I are placebo. Mm -hmm. We are not taking the latest and greatest mm -hmm. treatment. So rather than have to do that, can you utilize, I'm saying you and me, but uh, thousands of people's electronic medical records to be the baseline, right. rather than have to run that part of the cl uh, clinical studies? And what does that mean for the regulatory science? So we're examining things uh, like that. We're talking about another aspect of the, the collaborative research process, which is how do we better interface uh, with patient groups? You don't start down a discovery process without first engaging with patient advocacy groups and patient groups because you need them to better understand the disease, to better understand the potentials for treatment, to get data and feedback um, into your research process so that you're making sure you're meeting the patient's need above all, as well as the needs of the scientists and the physicians that are, that are uh, participating. So we'll be talking more and more about how we engage um, better with the patient groups mm -hmm. um, and, yeah. and, and uh, uh, enhance the science of discovery and enhance the speed of discovery. So a couple of things we're talking about. There, there'll be others, yeah. um, but it's all great. <laughs> uh, it sounds like it. It is. Well, thank you so much, John, You're for welcome. your time today Delighted and to be here. for thank the preview you. of this week's meeting. Great. We appreciate Good. it. And I'm Mabel Chong. Thanks for watching.